introduce you to um, what delusional infestation is, um, how it manifests, manifests itself, what its definition is, history, and, and basically getting an understanding of it. Some of this material is pretty dense. Um, for those who are a little squeamish, be prepared. There's some pretty graphic images here um, <clears throat> because delusional uh, infestation is kind of rough um, and it's very, very complicated um, and involves many different disciplines and professions. Um, what I want everybody to do in this talk is to not do this, scratch. Okay, don't scratch and see how many of you actually don't scratch by the end of this talk. Um, scratching is and itching is very much a human um, um, hang up as it were. Um, pain um, and itching are actually synonymous. Um, you imagine having an itch and not being able to scratch it, it becomes intolerable. And so over hum human history and evolution, we've actually evolved a high sensitivity in our fingertips, a lot of nerve endings in our fingertips, as well as flat nails. And the flat nails are for the purpose of self-grooming. So we can, you know, remove dirt, debris, dead skin, or unwanted organisms. So the sense of itch is very uh, potent with people. Um, I'm going to be going through these uh, sections, uh, basically an introduction and the definition, history, arthropods and medical significance, which repeatedly come up when uh, working with delusion infestation cases. Um, Gail, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're still seeing your notes pages. So oh. we're not seeing the actual presentation. Really? Can you see that now? Perfect, yes. Okay, that is odd. <laughs> okay. Um, medical aspects and delusion of infestation sign, understanding the process of decline in the secondary DI condition. And I'll explain that shortly. Okay. My first case was in 1996. And by 2021, if you look at the table to the left, I had 609 cases. Basically, delusion of infestation was um, pretty low key until around 2008, 2010. Um, and basically it was uh, kicked off by the Great Recession. A lot of people lost their jobs, employers were facing laying off um, employees. There was a lot of social stress and DI um, became very much um, a presence in um, the cases that I was receiving at the experiment station. So you can see at two, six, two, uh, 2008, I had 69 cases. It stayed in the 60s, 2009, then it jumped up into the um, nearly 100 the following year and steadily has been climbing since then. Um, I'm also an expert in bed bugs, and so um, I attract a lot of attention on that. And I noticed that when the New York Times did um, some data mining using Time Machine um, around 2010, when there was a lot of chatter about bed bugs in the media, if you notice, bed bugs inquiries jumped a great deal, and with it came delusion of infestation. So it's very interesting how the media plays a role in this and information. What is it? Um, we are currently, uh, in, in, in November of 2021, uh, um, 2020, we had this uh, symposium in uh, November under the leadership of the Entomology Society of America. And I brought together um, 12 scientists uh, to present about delusion of infestation. Um, with that um, experience, we've decided to publish a book, write a book for physicians, um, because the medical profession seems to somewhat benighted. It's kind of a dark corner, but has become uh, very much part of the social conversation. 
But when you look at past definitions of delusions of infestation, which had different names, like delusions of parasitosis, for instance, the American Medical Association has it as a as a dermopsychiatric condition characterized by patients' fixed and false belief that their skin is infested with pathogens. Morgellons, a lay term, has been used to describe an unexplained constellation of symptoms, etc. Ekbon, symptoms with delusion parasitosis, a belief that one's body is infested with invisible bugs. That's from the annual review of entomology. And the Morgellons is from CDC. These are really short, very concise definitions, but so much more to this. This is a very complicated process. And so this is a de definition we're working on. Not only does it define it, but it also explains it. And it's a work in progress, but basically this is what we see as DI. It is a psychiatric illness um, characterized by patients holding a monothematic Thing, single thinking, tenacious and often fixed belief of an infestation of their skin, body, or immediate environment, which is not supported by objective medical evidence. The intensity of this delusion is dynamic and variable over time. Many patients not merely overvalue ideas. The delusional beliefs may be shared between individuals, it can be perceived as pathogens, including living organisms such as parasites, bacteria, viruses, worms, and insects. So it's a cohort of organisms. Organic or non-organic infiltration by fibers, threads, or other forms as animate particles or objects, including the so-called subset of Morgellons syndrome, known or unknown to medical science, are also reported. DI can arise as a primary or secondary delusion, and I'll explain that shortly. For an ICD-11 diagnosis, that's the International Classification of Disease for Mortality and Morbidity Statistics from the World Health Organization, symptoms of DI should be present for more than one month without meeting the criteria for schizophrenia or another major medical illness. The delusion may be additional to organic pathology, such as medical or neurological issues, psychiatric disorders, or environmental sensitivities, substance abuse, which is quite common, or as side effects to various medications. The psychopathology aspect is limited to the delusion and abnormal tactile sensations related to the delusional theme. Wild, and this is important, patients are otherwise entirely mentally healthy and argue rationally if they discuss issues other than their infestation. So you can have a normal conversation with somebody about their family, but when you get around to the delusion, it's a fixed idea that's locked into their psyche. The symptoms of DI impact all aspects of everyday life, including work, relationships, and quality of life. It constitutes a high disease burden and is debilitating disorder that causes significant suffering to the individual and their loved ones. Many people with DI lose insight and challenge the lack of object findings of the infestation. Therefore, treatment compliance is variable and suffering can be significantly protracted. I've had, I deal with cases who have been suffering from DI for years. It's a heady piece. It's a it's like a big red piece of steak as far as information is concerned. But this lays out the fundamentals of what delusional infestation is. Now I said there's two types. Type one is primary delusion, which is a psychiatric illness. Um, it's usually kicked off by schizophrenia and I've dealt with schizophrenic cases, okay? And basically, uh, the person lose is uh, self-awareness, judgment. They have issues with visual, con spatial control, physical sensation. Um, they have difficulties with problem solving and disordered reasoning. That's the psychiatric form. The form that I deal with most of the time is the secondary delusion, okay? 
which is evoked by the sensation of an itch or an internal or external parasitic sensation. It's often triggered by under, undiagnosed underlying medical conditions. Um, when dealing with secondary delusion, there is a range of progressive illness from mild to chronic. So somebody can have DI for a week or two and it's gone, or it can become chronic where it is um, experienced for years. Um, DI can not always start with, it, DI can, but not always start with a real misunderstood the undiagnosed underlying medical disorder that over time can gain this psychiatric component. So you start with a sensation and then over time there begins to develop into this, build into this a psychiatric aspect. This is why it becomes very complex. Okay, delusion has many forms. Double delusion is when the inducer, the person who is ill with the delusion thinks they are being infested from someone else, such as um, other people, um, situations of children and animals. This can be very difficult. Infestation by proxy is where the inducer thinks that someone else is infested. So a child or another adult or a companion um, or a pet or an object is actually infested. Um, I've had a case where a woman considered her car was infested. Um, somebody who was looking after wild animals thought they were infested. Induced delusional infest infestation is when the inducer gets other people to believe that they're infested as well. Um, and so they are associated and they feed off one another. So these are several forms of the eye. So where's the history? I have um, researched back into the 1500s. So there's records for 600 years of DI. And since 1894, there's at least 40 different iterations of the name. I'm not even going to go through the list. So you can see there's a, a fundamental struggle to understand where to put DI, it, it just falls between the cracks because of this multi-layered aspect of the condition. So um, let's sort of start somewhere with DI. Um, and I'm starting with Sir Thomas Brown because his work um, promoted the um, Morgellons Research Foundation and Morgellons activity at the turn of this century. Um, what happened was there was a nurse, Mary Leteo, in the early 2000s, who began to believe that her son had a condition and when she, which was a dermatitis. And when she approached um, numerous physicians, they could not diagnose. They said, there's nothing there. So she did research and she found the writings of Sir Thomas Brown. Sir Thomas Brown was born in 1604. Um, he was born to a wealthy merchant in England and he went through um, privilege education at a boys school in Winchester, Southern England and then eventually got his fine arts degree in um, 1629. Um, following that, he decided to become a doctor. So he went down to France and actually spent three years in Europe training as a doctor. He went to Montpellier in France for the first year. Second year, he went into Italy and then finished in Germany in the third year in Leipzig. Now, while he was in Montpellier, um, he began to be aware of a population of children in the Pyrenean mountain foot uh, foothill uh, uh, region called Languedoc. 
And there's descriptions of these children suffering from an unknown form of dermatitis. Now, there are authors who have written about this particular region. Now, this region is very poor, lack of education, and actually witchcraft was quite a common practice in this region. Uh, and these authors picked up on this particular characteristic within this population. Um, Flaventis Victoris wrote, a paragraph describing what he saw out there. And this is what he said. There exists in little children certain living principles having the appearance of worms, which are called the common, to the common folk draconia. They settle especially in the muscular parts of the body to wit the arms. Now you need to take note of where they're describing this. Okay, the arms and the legs and the calves the backs of the lower legs. Occasionally they even congregate on the flanks under the skin and sometimes occupy the whole back or failing that at least the inner scapular region. We destroy these worms of this type that are the habit of lurking in the pores of infants and little girls. All right, the second author, Shank, wrote in 1665, worms or as others will have it hairs that are wont to infest themselves of arms, calves, and back in infants and children, which are unknown to the old authorities. So there's this conversation going on in this region. And Thomas Brown um, actually wrote about this, but 40 years after he'd been there, he wrote a wandering piece called A Letter to a Friend and mentions this at the end of a paragraph where he's talking about man's masculinity. And one sentence shows the example of this. Though the beard be only a distinction of a sex, a sign of masculine heat by illness and so on. And he then goes on to talk about the Hungarian king and then closes this paragraph. So this is wandering dialogue uh, with this. Hairs which have most amused me have not been in the face or head, but on the back and not in men, but children. As I long ago observed 40 years before in that edemial distemper of children in Languedoc called Morgellons. Now he's called it Morgellons in its anglicized word for the French word masculin which was also used to describe this particular condition in children, wherein they critically break out with harsh hairs on their backs, which takes off the unique symptoms of the disease and delivers them from coughs and convulsions. So there's this conversation and people, are, these, these, these doctors are talking about this, but not understanding. But if you start to read the descriptions, there's a consistency. And the consistency is that you've got the calves and the back and the shoulders and the arms. Now, it's in, in traditional care of young children, particularly infants, they will lay their infants on their backs. Okay, now if you're an infant, and a perfectly healthy infant, you will have a diaper or a nappy. And so the areas of the hips, the buttocks, that's not mentioned in any of the writing. They're talking about the arms, the exposed parts of the body. Now, bedding was mostly consists of either fabric which contained straw or just open straw. So as you can see in this left illustration, this is a bed from Denmark. It's a wooden box with straw in it and you'd sleep on it. Um, on the right, you've got Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts. The stuffing of the mattresses is straw. Now, it's in, you've got to think back to these times. Um, there are pests in fields. And one of the common mites that is seen in, in, in straw is called the storage mite. 
which can cause a dermatological reaction. And so I'm personally very suspicious that these kids were not were being in part affected by possibly contact dermatitis with their straw. Additionally, if you look to the right here, let me get my highlighter going. Can you see that? Here, um, these three illustrations on the right, are uh, illustrations of what looks like scabies mites. So I think these children also had issues with scabies, but this illustration written by, uh, uh, drawn by Emula um, around 1862 shows um, characteristics of a, let me just, get my pointer, there we go, of this creature. It possesses possible light sensing organs called a celly. It seems to have antenna. It has a head, no legs, a sort of brushy tail. And it does not represent any living creature known to science. So I think this is a fanciful illustration. The illustration of the three mites on the right is accurate. So where I'm moving to this is that the Morgellons um, concept was derived from a base where there was a lack of understanding what actually was going on. So um, when we, when you're working with cases of delusion infestation, it's very important for you to know the biology of the organisms that cause, cause dermatitis or enteric conditions cold. Because when DI cases come to you, they can present these very laudable biologies of organisms. And if you don't know your biologies of the actual organisms cold, you can get yourself into deep water. So scabies is number one. A lot of cases uh, present to doctors and doctors will immediately identify as um, pa uh, patients with scabies. I think the big problem with the medical profession is the belief that to excise a scabies mite from its burrow, here's the female and there's the eggs and there's the exit to the burrow, is a difficult act. It isn't. You can squeeze her out of the, her little burrow slide around her and look at her within a five minute time period. It's a very quick analysis. Um, many patients look as if they've got scabies because they have self-treated and so their skin is extremely dry. Um, and so the scabies diagnosis is um, higher than it should be. Scabies is also, um, not often seen in civilized non-warlike situations. You will see scabies in situations of high social stress, such as um, war or refugee situations where high numbers of people are forced to sleep close, close to each other, body to body. Okay, scabies mites cannot be transferred from, from person to person with casual contact, such as a handshake. You have to be in physical contact with somebody who has scabies for a prolonged skin to skin period of time. So scabies is a problematic diagnosis with DI. Uh, the other one that is high on the list is bird mites. Um, and there are various websites out there that promote the idea that bird mites infest people. No, they don't. They infest birds, period. Birds are dinosaurs. They are 
flying dinosaurs. And so the entire physical makeup is designed for lightness. And so their skin is paper thin, it's extremely thin. Um, their bones are hollow. Um, there's all, there's numerous other characteristics that allow these animals to fly. Now, because the skin of the bird is very thin, the mouth parts of bird mites are very short. We have thick mammalian rubber-like skin with a fat layer underneath before you can even get to a capillary. The mouth parts of a bird mite cannot physically get blood from a person. What happens is when there's a, for example, a infested sparrow nest on a building, they raise their young in the spring, they're infested with bird mites, then they fledge and leave. There's a population of bird mites left behind in the nest. They then proceed to migrate to look for food. They're looking for other birds. They will wander into a, play, uh, a human residence and then attempt to feed on you because they're thirsty. They, they're, they haven't had fluids possibly for uh, several days. And so you will get a bird mite on you and it will attempt to feed and you'll get the pricking sensation of it trying to get through, you know, penetrate the skin. That's it. They cannot survive on people. And it's very straightforward for correcting the problem. You find the bird nest, you remove it, you vacuum and clean the area uh, in the vicinity of the nest. And that's the end of it. Bird mites, if they are still present, will only survive about three weeks and then they're dead. So bird mites absolutely cannot survive on the people. Dead bugs, of course, is another very obvious um, uh, discussion point. Uh, head lice, crab lice, and ticks. These are all brought up by uh, DI clients. Um, other uh, arthropods that can cause um, issues with DI cases is thrips, particularly in the summer months when there's a severe drought. Thrips can attempt to drink and will attempt to penetrate the skin. Follicle mites, most of us have them, uh, particularly around the uh, eyebrows. Um, clover mites, again, springtails, that's another uh, big issue with uh, DI cases. Uh, velvet mites, uh, spiders, this is a brown recluse spider. Again, uh, DI cases can bring up the brown recluse. Again, understand the brown recluse is only isolated in certain regions of the United States, so you need to know the distribution of it. It's not up in the northern areas of the country. Dust mite allergies, biting flies like mosquitoes. You know, become familiar with these biologies. So let's go and look at um, briefly at um, springtails because this comes up in the conversation. In 2004, Deborah Anschilder in the Journal of New York Entomology Society published a paper and in the opening abstract, she writes, any and all fields of view that appeared incongruous to normal human skin were digitally photographed. When the photographic images were initially evaluated, no common factor was identified. However, more extensive scrutiny using imaging software revealed evidence of calembola or springtails in 18 out of 20 participants. These are people who said that they got springtails and they were being infested by springtails. All right. It was a erroneous paper, but has been quoted um, a great deal by delusion and infestation patients and clients and also the Morgellon Foundation. It was refuted by two springtail experts, Kenneth Christensen and Ernest Bernard in 2008. And they, this is what they say, claims of persistent human skin infection by springtails may indicate a neurological problem or else delusional parasitosis, a psychological, not entomological problem. Barenbaum commented on the Anschula et al. paper, suggesting that the report is based on 
peridiola. That is, the researchers simply imagined that they saw springtail-like shapes in the images when there were no springtails actually present. In this paper, we, we more specifically and categorically refute the contention of the Anshula pa paper. So the Anshula paper has caused a great deal of mischief in the DI conversation. This is what they saw and they blew it up and imagined a springtail. It's just a blob. And then they doctored it. Here is a scale to what? So this was a faulted paper and it has caused a great deal of issue with uh, folks who are working with DI cases because it's, it's not true. All right, paradiola, here we go. Illusion is the first of all pleasures. Um, it's quoted as coming from Voltaire or um, Oscar Wilde. And we are all prone to self-delusion. On the left, you can see it looks like an elephant, doesn't it? On the right, can you see the head of a man with his eyes closed and his hair and his ear? But look again, it's a child there's child's face, the bonnet, sitting on the knee of her father or his father with the mother standing next to her, her child. Here is, whoops, here is another example. Gorgeous looking lake with mountains in the back. But if you look at that lake more carefully, it's actually a wall with sunlight running across the top. Now, this image on the top right is that a young woman looking away, kind of coyly, or is it an old crone with her chin, her nose and her eye? Is this a rabbit down here or is this a duck on the bottom right? So we can self delude and this is one of the elements of DI. Okay, as I said before, bird mites have been touted as infesting people. So you go to uh, websites like birdsmite.org and they, they present a fairly convincing narrative to a DI case who wants to have confirmation of what they're believing. Um, another book, um, The Year of the Might, is also pushing this concept. Um, the Morgellons Disease Foundation also pushes the idea of microscopic subcutaneous fibers, sometimes referred to as filaments in the skin. Um, light microscopy enables the visualization of these unusual fibers and often colored red, blue, black, and white. This is man-made fibers that have become entrapped by the weeping of a wound, but it has become a feature of Morgellons condition. So the, Mary in 2000, when she felt like her son had got Morgellons became very organized and she actually um, influenced uh, several um, people in Congress, members of Congress, into persuading the CDC to do a study of Morgellons and a specific population in Northern California. It was about 110 uh, patients who had complained of having Morgellons or some kind of dermatitis condition. The study took six years and it finally was published in 12, 2012 under the leadership of Pearson. They found absolutely nothing. What they found was man-made fibers. This is an example of cotton fiber, but mostly man-made fiber. So it, it refuted this belief that um, Morgellons is actually some kind of condition resulting in fiber infestation. So medical aspects. Never ever depend on skin lesions when a patient um, presents themselves to you for evidence. This is an amoxicillin reaction. This is mosquito. This is a pimple. This is mold. This is thyroid. This is self-mutilation, and this is grass allergies. 
clients who come with DI will present this. So you should never depend on the skin lesions because it could be anything. Clients also have testimonials. Um, this is an example of it. In the, mem in the morning, our whole body burns. I'm sending these containers with a few plastic bags with different things in them. They, remember this word, they have wings. They get into our hairs. They get through our clothes. It makes holes in the cottons clothes. They bite the skin. It's like it eats the surface of the skin and you see the blood and on and on and on. So you get these descriptions which are really um, off the wall. You will also have clients presenting you with numerous specimens to prove their point, particularly those who have suffered from DI for a long period of time. This is a, a photograph given to me by Nancy. And if you see the circle, that's prednisone. Okay, medications can um, kick off DI. Um, examples of DI, this lady on the right was picking at her eyebrow. Um, this is classic DI injury. Um, the round lesions are caused by the nails digging into the skin. Another interesting feature of DI is where people can reach. This is clearly injury caused by the right hand going over the left shoulder. And this injury down here, it's the left arm going under the right arm. Notice the left arm can't reach over here. So you can see her right arm's more physical. But if you notice in the center in the shoulder blades, there's lack of injury. Now, if it's a true medical condition, you would see it all over the body. So these are indicators that somebody may be having uh, issues with DI. Here's a case I dealt with. This woman was picking the, her fingernails off. I got her boyfriend to agree to help her deal with this issue. And she wore a glove for a week and you can see the healing. And once she recognized that she was causing this to herself and she was responding to an underlying undiagnosed medical condition. She seeked help and was cured. All right, so the issues. The condition is very much non-selective. There is also a great deal of ignorance uh, in the medical profession, particularly, and in the, in the general public at large. And is not, it is not taken seriously. Um, there's a there's also a circular door aspect about uh, the medical profession where the doctors are literally listening to what the patients are saying and the patients being misinformed um, and presenting these um, descriptions of being attacked throws the doctors off and so sends them in completely different directions. And um, the self-diagnosis by these patients can make it very difficult for a doctor to see through the words and see actually what's going on. It is also in the United States, a condition that's severely underreported because patients, um, once they've been to a doctor and not been satisfied, they'll go to a doctor doctor and they'll bounce from doctor to doctor to doctor. Okay, so also there are medical confidentiality rules um, and also there's a stigma, social stigma, particularly in the United States against psychiatric illness. And there is other two elements, confirmation bias and some cost fallacy. <clears throat> confirmation bias, and we all have it, um, and it's perfectly normal, is we will find information that supports a belief uh, system. So we can actually be self-deceptive. And so we can filter out information that does not support a belief that we have. Some cost fallacy makes the DI much more difficult because the longer a client or patient is uh, invested, particularly with time, money, and effort, the more potent the DI effect becomes. In many ways, it includes a form of cognizant cognitive dissonance where there is a need to feel in control and to avoid regret. Regret is an emotion that none of us finds pleasant. 
But some costality, for instance, one of the classic examples is um, you buy a concert ticket, an expensive one, two or $300. Like you go to New York to um, a theater in New York, you could spend two to $300. There's a nasty storm that night. Are you going to go to that concert or are you going to stay home and forgo the ticket? Many people will attempt to go through that snowstorm or ice storm or a hurricane <laughs> to that concert because they've invested the time and money. Um, other forms of sunk cost fallacy is remaining in a personal relationship hoping that it's going to get better when things change. Um, overeating in all you can eat dining, that's particularly um, prevalent in the South, you pay a door fee of $30 and you can eat as much lobster as you like. Um, and that can um, you know, cause a great deal of self-harm. So some cost fallacy is perfectly normal human behavior, but it works very negatively in DI cases. So what is DI sign? Okay, what are the red flags? A, it can kill, so take, take it seriously. I've lost two people um, in the time I worked with the eye, one by accidental over-medication uh, combining with pesticide treatment and also a call center technician who uh, committed suicide. Um, DI sign clearly can blindside medical professions, but what you'll notice is a chattering mind and the recording that's coming up will show this. Um, the clients almost within five minutes of the first encounter will quickly deny that there's any kind of psychological or that they are mad. Clearly that's been leveled at them before they came to me. They're very vocal about their life problems um, and particularly about the biologies of their, their uh, particular um, infestation. So they'll have wandering biologists. So if I challenge them, then they'll move their biology. Well, it's over this and this is what it's going to do. But if I change their conversation to their children or their grandchildren or um, what they're doing at work, it's a perfectly normal conversation. Um, the stories that they tell are felt and it's felt over any actual facts. They use memory as an indirect feeling. You'll see that clients come in very tense um, physically, um, they'll be reading your face to see if you're really taking them seriously. And in late stage DI uh, folks, they actually just come to you basically for you to validate them um, and um, support their beliefs. And when they are faced with contradictions, they repel, rebel, they, they push back against you. All right, the word bite, and the words they are very, very common in conversations. Um, they're very desperate. There's paranoia and this recording is gonna show this. Um, confusion of thinking. Um, they seek poor quality information. Um, they will also share more than necessary because there's what's called the stranger effect. So I can have an entire life history presented to me. Um, they initially, many will deny that they're taking medications, but once trust is garnered, you know, I, it's not unusual for these clients to have 10 to 12 different medications that they're taking. Um, they'll have visual and tactile hallucination on certain cases. Um, so check um, that they have good eyesight because a lot of these folks actually have visual impairment. They're clearly, uh, many will self-treat using alcohol um, medicines or chemicals. They have a naive trust in the internet um, and they are uh, very readily will get information um, offered to them um, from others and they will take on poor advice very quickly. They can become very angry and very frustrated and you will always have a high volume of samples. Okay, they listen but don't hear. There's plenty of doctor failure in this. Um, long time use of the same medication. I had one woman who had a sleep medication for 30 years. She developed an allergy to it. PTSD, I've had uh, soldiers from Afghanistan come to me who've got PSD, PTSD. Um, they, and so I deal with aggression sometimes and also power of suggestion involving families, friends and the workplace. 
Many cases have a neurological abnormality. Um, and in this, as you can see, this top image shows a normal uh, population of nerves just under the skin. This is the peripheral nerve system. In some people, it dies back. But the brain still, still thinks that there's, there's nerves on the skin. So what happens is a signal from the brain, which is constantly going out to check that you've got skin on you, will um, fire and you'll get a pricking sensation. And so a uh, neurological abnormality is one of the principal causes of DI. Here is another case, um, small fiber polyneuropathy. Uh, on the left, you can see the normal uh, structures of the skin just under the surface, and you can see nerve fibers perfectly fine. On the right, this is a case of fibromyalgia, and the number of cases have, DI cases, do experience fibromyalgia, where the nerve endings die. This is what happened to this woman. Um, this is a case um, that came to um, Anne-Louise Oaklander. She's part of this team of scientists that I'm working with on the book, and she had shingles, and there was neurological damage. And she literally scratched a hole through her skull into her brain. It's an, it is an extremely graphic case. She still has this permanent itch, but through therapy and medical treatment, she's been able to live with it. But for at least a year, she was actually tied. She came into the hospital, had her arms tied to the bed because the scratching occurred while she was asleep. Okay, look at the list of medical conditions, and this is not all of it. Um, the big uh, guns are allergies, uh, mold, um, dermatitis contact, uh, like straw itch mite, allergies to grass, weeds, dust, anemia, anxiety is big, depression is very big. It's one of the major drivers. Hyper and hypothyroidism, um, illegal drug use, which is very rarely admitted to. Internet surfing with algorithms that feed and validate the belief system. The internet is notorious for what it can contribute to DI. Lack of sleep, if you lose sleep, you lose control. Menopause in older women, OCD. Many of these clients will come in, they say they keep the house perfectly clean and they are very precise. Um, shock and trauma, PTSD is a big one, and also high levels of stress. Hence the jump of DI after 2008. And in 2021, for, for me, six, over 600 cases, a great deal of attributes to the, um, the pandemic. Okay. Groups that are affected by a DI patient are immediately the family and the friends, internet and social media, Facebook, you know, um, Twitter, general practitioners, dermatologists, university extension services, emergency departments, pest management professionals, health departments, epidemiologists, entomologists, social services, psychiatry and social counseling, veterinarians, and on and on. DI cases migrate. Let's understand the process of the secondary DI and how to help it. I just want to ask you something. There's something that's funny in these, these bugs here. It's like a, the, st the, stem of a, the, the stem of that flower that you found there, and it was pur purple, and uh, I, it makes three of them I find in my house, and they're, they, look, they look like a, a, they're, they're fresh. Well, I don't know where they fall out. I don't know where they come from. I don't have no, pur pur I don't have no stem flowers like this. I don't understand this. And then once I put them away, they they, they, dry, they die. And where the heck they they come in in the house? I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't. I don't. I, this is something. And uh, and all and all the bugs are still in the house. It's like crazy. And I, even I had a nurse, uh, another new uh, nurse, to come in air. And the minute she walked in the door, she felt that sensation in her in her face. And in her hair, and uh, oh, she, she, was, she was so uncomfortable. It, it's like a, I don't know what what kind of bugs there is in this house. Somebody implanted it, and it's like it's it's really it's it's a it drives your mind crazy. Something. So 
as you can see, she's got a chattering mind. Okay, and um, she uses allies, she's scattered thinking, and she uses the word they, all right, with a magical biologist. Um, let's hear a little more. Something's wrong, we're not crazy. Every nurse, everybody that comes in here have that same feeling. They feel it in their face. Something is not right. Something- She's denying madness, uh, mental illness. Something is going on, something I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's like a devil itself got control of everything. It's like this, I don't know what it is. Please give me, give me a call so I can talk to you. I don't know where to turn to. Something is wrong. It's not us, it's, we're not all, all these people that come here, all those nurses, they're not crazy, none of them. They feel that sensation when they come in here. They, they, they itch and they rub their face. And that woman that came the first, here, the first one, another nurse that came here there, the, the minute she walked in the, in the house, in the door, she felt, she felt it. She, she was scratching her hair, rubbing her face. and She didn't know what to, to make of this. She didn't, I don't know, I don't know. It's driving you crazy. And I can't get rid of it, no matter what filter I put in the, in the house or what. It's some, something that I don't understand. Thank you. So you, can, you know what you use the word, somebody planted it, that's the paranoia. So you've got all this to deal with when you're working with these clients. All right, so I haven't got much time left. So um, I know my presentation will be um, online. So I'm just gonna skip through the, a few of these um, um, uh, slides very quickly. Basically what I'm saying here is that um, DI, in, when somebody develops DI in the first six months, they are not fully invested. So they're questioning, they're looking for answers. Um, they are seeking care from doctors close by. They're starting to internet surf, um, but they're not finding answers. By three months, they're beginning to show some commitment and they're starting to um, do some self-harm. Following six months, a, a client often becomes much more invested. They're starting to question for verification. They're seeking further uh, treatment from other doctors. So there's doctor shopping. They're starting to do intense um, internet surfing. Uh, sunk cost fallacy and confirmation bias is, is certainly kicked in. There's a psychiatric addiction as well and self-harm. So basically trust in the y-axis in this slide it's very high when you first start off with DI. You're, you're still in the mainstream. You're still interested in what's going on. You're concerned, you're wor worried, but you're, you're willing to uh, um, you know, listen to people and you're optimistic. But as time, which is in the exercises, goes by, you slide. You lose the trust of your professionals. Um, the professional that the, the uh, DI client works with often becomes dismissed. DI habits replace normal life function and it becomes an obsessive, addictive behavior and you slide into fringe. And the fringe is fanaticism, narrow-mindedness, falling foul of unskilled self-proclaimed ex experts and pessimism. I'll pass over this particular part of the, of the talk, uh, but the limbic system, the lizard brain, will kick in and start to take over people's thinking when it's constantly, when you're being threatened. So the limbic system does play a big role in DI. Um, DI experiences the five stages of grief, anger, denial, depression, bargaining, finally acceptance. But as you can see, the, these are intermixed and um, it's not unusual for me to have clients burst into tears or become extremely angry. Um, the doctors um, are, have to deal with this as well. And there are problems with doctors like anchoring. Basically doctors will get an initial um, 
piece of information and diagnosis and stay with it without altering um, from the initial impression. And it's called anchoring. Also commissioned bias. Um, many doctors have to feel like they have to do something. They have to prescribe a medication. Sometimes they're overconfident. They have to do something. And the zebra retreat is retreating from making a rare diagnosis because sometimes there is a rare diagnosis, particularly when patients have traveled overseas or eaten roof raw food, resulting in them picking up an unusual parasite or organism, which is not endemic to the country that they live in, which is here in this case, the United States. So um, very briefly, you are perceived as the authority figure, okay? Verify the length of the time. If it's less than six months, you have a chance of turning the person away and getting proper medical care. Or if it's after six months, it's going to be a very long, hard haul to get a DI case, the care they need. Never work alone. Always have a second person because I've had a situation where clients have actually undressed in front of me. Um, I've prevented it. Also, if you need a break, you can step out. It's called the threshold effect leave the room to have a mental break, but still have somebody or another staff member present so that um, the patient has some kind of constant presence of a professional. You got to be empathetic. You've got to spend a lot of time and you've got to also allow to you know, listen, listen actively and don't buy into the patient's uh, chatter and language. You, it takes time, but you can garner trust be with them. Never debunk the belief system because it will immediately backfire. Um, talk with the client, validate their condition because it is real to them. What we have to do is figure out what's going on. Be patient. Patients will build a working relationship and then you have a chance to help the folks. Try and redirect uh, clients' energy. Turn their thoughts to more optimistic. Be very, very careful of patient lying and manipulation because some will do that to you. Um, try and insert facts to the addic uh, uh, addiction of thoughts. Um, and also involve the clients in their own sampling. And I'm gonna jump to this. Get them to vacuum samples um, using the end of a vacuum uh, cleaner with a coffee filter over the end will produce a very clean sample. If they feel a, a, a pinching sensation on their skin, I always use the pinching word, not biting, because we don't know what's on there. They can put a piece of scotch tape on it, lay it on a piece of glass, label it and present it. Discourage clients searching for information on the internet. It is lethal because the internet algorithms steer information to a person's clicks and search times. So this is a must see if um, um, you get a chance to see it, is the next flick docudrama, The Social Dilemma. It is an interview of the engineers who develop these algorithms that track your searches and DI cases go straight down the rabbit hole using the internet for information to discourage them from getting onto the internet. So the future. Recognize it's not an uncommon disorder. It's, as we can verify, it's a very common disorder. Recognize high public anxiety towards insects and other pathogens. Um, and particularly um, when there's a focus of illness, economic and social distress. You have to develop a multidisciplinary team for care, which is the village. So it will be the entomologist in my case, the doctors, epidemiologists, families, social services, and pest management professionals. And then again, the education and medical profession, which we're working on at this point. So I wonder how many of you actually scratched during this talk. And that's it. Um, I hope that's been enlightening. Um, it's a very difficult subject. It's very dense, but um, there is hope for the future. I think there's gaining uh, understanding with the condition 
And I think DEI will become more and more recognized as a, as a, a real medical condition with a psychiatric element to it. So it's a marriage of many different elements. And um, I'm hopeful that in the future, DI patients will get the care that they certainly deserve.